devil in a red dress Call 911, I'm a killer You know I hate to confess Bang, bang, got my hand on the trigger The devil in a red dress Call 911, I'm a killer Yep, it's time for some hell of it, shall we say. Uh, and uh, this is always a hot <laughs> Oh my God, a hot topic. I didn't even intend that. Uh, is this, the old subconscious keeps spewing them up. Uh, uh, this is a, a major topic in Christian theology and in religious psychology. And uh, so I want to do a brief presentation on this, at least as brief by my standards, and uh, then have a bunch of uh, comments and questions on it. So without further ado, let me take a crack at it. Suppose a man proposes marriage to a woman. He tells her he loves her and wants to do great things for her. And just to sweeten the deal, he pulls a gun on her and threatens to blow her pretty head off if she turns him down. Absurd as it sounds, absurd as it is, things like this have happened because there are dangerously insane people out there. Is one of them named Jehovah? It kind of sounds like it when we're told that God loves us more than tongue can tell, and that if we turn down his gospel of salvation, he's going to consign us to eternal torture. It is a case of what Paul Watzlowick calls the be spontaneous paradox, where some action or feeling is commanded despite the fact that by nature it must arise freely. It is a cruel joke rendering the mandated behavior impossible. What, God doesn't know this? It is easier to imagine that a bunch of boneheaded bishops and theologians didn't know it or felt it was worth fostering an absurdity or two if the terror of it could keep the suckers in line. Oh no, say the defenders of the faith, the sacred spin doctors. We were already in trouble, having sinned against God and buying our own asbestos ticket to the inferno. God is throwing us a life preserver so we won't drown in the lake of burning sulfur. Yeah, and uh, who was it, pray tell, who decided we deserved hell in the first place? The, uh, the angry Jehovah, that's who. Everything about this is not only absurd, but reprehensible. Is the damning decree possible for a just deity? I mean... Who could possibly deserve eternal torment? I dare say that not even Hitler could deserve that. Such a god pretty much is Hitler. Call it the Holocaust. And is it at all thinkable that a loving Heavenly Father could subject his wayward creatures to such treatment? If you say yes, you're stretching the definition of love so far as to turn it into its opposite. Eh, better forget it. One more thing. Since God is supposed to be compelling sinners to roast in hell, obviously against their will, why doesn't he instead enlighten and sanctify them? Imagine, upon their demise, the sinners snap out of it. What was I thinking? How stupid could I have been? Thank God he's ca caused the scales to fall from my eyes. Hallelujah. Not a bad scenario, is it? Some seek to avoid that possibility, suggesting that sinners choose to go to hell. That is so stupid as to require no refutation. Granted, plenty of people choose not to repent, not to accept the gospel, but of course, no one actually prefers to go to hell. They don't think there is a hell to go to. They didn't believe in Christ, so why should hell beliefs seem more plausible to them? It only gets perverse when Christians try to mitigate the prospect of a fiery pit of hell, 
by half demythologizing it, psychologizing it. They suggest that the torment of hell will simply be inconsolable regret for not having repented before it was too late. This is too rich. Let me get this straight. Up on earth, these sinners didn't give a hoot about God, but now they do. Now they heartily wish they could bask in the beatific vision. And God just gives them the finger? Death then immediately sanctifies them, imparting a longing for God which does them no good. Ludicrous. All in all, when Christianity wields the stick as well as the carrot, threatening damnation for those who spurn the message, it must be dismissed as the height of superstition. Universal salvation, that is, Jesus died to save humanity and it worked, would at least not be superstitious, whether true or not. Now, it's not just Christianity. How about Buddhism, which many feel is a much more sane, merciful, and humane uh, version of the afterlife? Well, let's just see about that. According to Buddhist dogma, one might re be reborn in any of the hundreds of distinct hells, some cold, some hot, others unspeakable. Here is a list which I will not condense so as not to ameliorate the astonishing sadism of the pious imaginations that dream them up. Uh, you will not depart from there until you've paid every farthing you owe, but that day will come, perhaps millions of years hence, and you will begin to the long climb upward again. So here's the list with a couple of explanatory notes. First, there's reanimation hell. After being torn apart by demons, your members are joined again for another go at it, and again and again forever. Or you might be cast into the sewage hell, or the sword circle hell. Uh, where uh, it's not just blades, but you get peppered with hell spark cluster bombs. Or there's the uh, cooking pot hell. You're in it. Uh, many, uh, the hell of many pains, which uh, involves you taking whatever harm you dished out to others in life. Oh, you might find yourself in the smothering darkness hell or the uh, torment by cries of fowls. <laughs> Can't you shut those birds up? Or the over-the-cliff hell, which I assume is over and over again. Or there's the disease hell, or the iron-paired hell. Not quite sure what that means. The evil stick hell. You really have to run the gauntlet forever on this one. How about the black weasel hell, the spinning hell, the hell of complete pain? Oh boy, that sounds like a goodie. Or you might be in the red lotus hell, the pond hell, the hell of torments received in the air. I guess it's sort of skeet shooting hell. Uh, how about the black line hell? Uh, your body is marked with black dotted lines along which red hot saws begin to rip. Oh, there's the equal screaming hell uh, where nobody hears you. There's the uh, ever popular eye plucking hell or the fearful vulture hell. Or I uh, think you could stand to lose a few pounds. How about the squeezing and grinding hell, also known as the crowded hell? Oh, there's the stabbing, cooking, boiling hell. Or the, if you prefer, the shredding hell. Uh, let's not forget the veins cutting hell. Or the hell of evil sights. Too squeamish to go to a horror movie. You get nothing but there. How about the, oh my God, the frustrated bestiality hell. Boy, you can't get a date, I'm telling you. Uh, the fiery rapist gay hell. The hell of enduring pain. I 
would assume that's sort of the idea of all the hells. There, there's the insect hell. You don't like those gnats? Well, that's just the beginning. How about the tantalus hell, as I call it? In other words, you're always hungry and thirsty, but you just can't get anything. The hell of burning tears. The hell where all your organs are destroyed. The hell of no other shore. There's not even the prospect of salvation. There's no alternative, no light at the end of the tunnel. The deadly lotus pond hell. Who knows what lurks in its depths. The molten copper hell. The fire jar hell. The hell of fiery iron iron powder. Oh, of course, this isn't a surprise. The screaming hell where scalding water is poured down your throat. The Muslims also have that one, by the way. Then there's the great howling hell. He ain't getting any sleep there, I'm afraid. Hell filled with voices. The burning hair hell. Oh, man, oh, man. Uh, how about the fire insect hell? Like fire ants, I guess. Um, but they might be like in the movie Them, I guess. The burning steel pestle hell. You know what that is, right? When you know, you, you're know you in the 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 the, uh, the, the uh, bowl part of it, you just get pounded to dust. The twin flame of burning stones hell. The slaughtering hell. The field of steel trees. The hell of complete darkness. Uh, the field of Yamaruja, where demons burn you head to soul. The sword forest. Ouch. And if you happen to get through that, uh, there's also the large sword forest. The plantain smoke har uh, forest. The forest of burning smoke. The burning cloud mist hell. And there's the random demonic harassment hell. I'm assuming all these sound a bit better in the Asian languages. The great screaming hell where you simmer in molten lead. Oh boy. The roaring hell. The hell of infinite numbers of pains. Count them. The hell of unbearable pain. The hell of hatred. The hell of total darkness, the dark smoke hell, the hell where sinners drop like flies, the dismemberment by burning in blue lotus flames hell, sounds like that's sort of created by an interior decorator or something, the rolling hell where you are hindered from protecting endangered loved ones. The hell of vain desires. I guess that's kind of like uh, Tantalus. The twin suffering hell. The hell where <laughs> where enemies clip off your... F <laughs> oh, my God. The hell where enemies clip off your flesh and force you to eat it. The hell of diamond-beaked birds. Uh, Woody Woodpecker, get away. The flaming hair hell. Didn't we already have one of those? The stabbing pain hell, the hell of limitless pain, the hell where blood and bones are consumed, the hell of eleven flames, the red hot hell, uh, fire sixteen times as hot as any other hell, hell, the paradise mirage charcoal pit hell. You know, you think you you got uh, nice uh, steaks uh, sizzling uh, on the barbecue, but instead that's your flesh you're smelling. Uh, the circling dragon hell, the molten copper, iron fish, and diamond beaked worms hell. Oh, then how about the iron cauldron hell, the floating in a river of blood hell, the bone-eating insect hell, the seeing loved ones cook hell, the endless submersion hell, talk about waterboarding, the lotus with diamond thorns hell, the dangerous cliff hell, the diamond bone hell, the black line hell, the crocodile hell, the dark firewind hell, the diamond beak hornet hell, 
Don't even have beaks? Anyway, white hot hell, hell burning in all directions, the fearful hell of large roaring bodies, burning hell of string like worms, fire rain hell, where diamond sand grinds the flesh from the body. <laughs> the place of internal boiling. You better bring your omeprazole. Uh, the shouting hell, the, de the demonic skin-peeling hell, the hell of raining iron spikes, the hell of marrow-sucking worms, the flesh-scraping flesh hell, the flaming arrow and diamond sword net hell, the cooking pot hell. Didn't we have that one before? A uh, thousand-headed dragon hell, cooking and pulverizing hell, the hell of spinning trees and molten pewter, the relentless hell, aren't they all? Bird mouth hell, which is a hundred times more painful than the previous seven as one's mouth is ripped away as the hunter tears away the bird's beak, grows back, gets ripped away again, etc. There's the hell where everything faces the ground. There is genital torture hell. The hell of roaring beasts, the hell of being devoured by iron beasts, the hell of black bile, the ocean of corpses hells, the nightmare hell, the hell of crushing beneath the root of a burning tree, the hell of crushing by mountains, just like in the Bible, right? They will call out to the mountains, uh, fall upon us. The hell of dropping by a giant bird, look out below the hell of sparks, the hell of blinding by molten copper or hot sand, the hell of stench, the hell of iron plates, the hell of eleven flames. But now for some relief, there are also eight cold hells. Bring your long johns. There's the chap, the chapping hell, repeated dips in freezing water, the popped blister hell, the inarticulate cry hell, the paralyzed tongue hell, you can't even do any good screaming there, the teeth gnashing hell, the blue flower sores hell, uh, the inflamed sores hell, and the flesh dropping frostbite hell. Yikes, I'm telling you, it's like a travel agency brochure here. Now, the hit history of hell is the refutation of hell. We can trace the gradual evolution of the hell concept. The Old Testament knows nothing of it, instead positing either just plain death, as in Genesis 3.19, or the Babylonian shadow realm of Sheol, to which all must go, good or evil, as in Isaiah 14.9-20. The Old Testament does know of a fiery netherworld, the realm of Molech or Moloch, if you prefer those vowels, uh, opening at the foot of Mount Zion. This was called Tophet and Gehenna, the place where living infants were offered in sacrifice. But it was not yet thought of as a place of post-mortem punishment for the wicked. During the Hellenistic period, Judaism adopted the Greek Tartaros, the deep cavern where Zeus had confined the rebellious Titans. In Judaism, the Titans were replaced by the Watchers, the fallen angels. But even this was not yet a fiery hell. That element was apparently derived from the preaching of Neo-Pythagorean missionaries who got the idea from the volcanic geography of their homeland in Sicily and Italy. The truth does not grow in such a fashion. Myths do. And if the danger of hell was always there, always real, why do we not hear of it till so late in the day? though the superstitious character of hell belief seems overwhelmingly obvious. The idea of eternal punishment, eternal torment, remains so daunting that even very intelligent, sophisticated individuals feel it would be wiser not to take the chance of incurring it. They still believe in it almost as if denying it would, inset, would, it, would itself constitute a hanging offense. And besides, is there really an eschatological insurance policy to be had? 
If one fears reprisals for not embracing Christianity, one is far from being out of the woods. By accepting the Christian gospel, you're ipso facto buying a ticket to one or more Islamic, Buddhist, or Hindu hells. If you're going to be afraid of hell, there's no escape that way. The religions you didn't accept might be right, and you're headed for their hell. Perhaps the most damning, no pun intended, aspect of hell belief is that it retards moral growth by making it impossible for the hell believer ever to grow beyond the crudest, most infantile, quote, morality, unquote. Keep your hand out of the cookie jar or mommy's gonna spank you. A doctrine that retards moral growth simply cannot be taken seriously any more than one that promotes bigotry. We just cannot cripple ourselves by disregarding our better judgment and basing our beliefs on fear. The recurring what-ifs must be recognized for what they are, what we as Christians called temptations insidious, whispering voices bidding us to do the wrong thing. We must stand our ground and refuse to give in. Only so can we ever arrive at, quote, a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind, unquote. The voices will die away after a while. There's no reason to take them seriously, and we must ever remind ourselves of that. These are some of the things that make me dismiss the notion as not plausible enough to worry about. Sure, it might conceivably be true, but you could say the same for, say, the crazy belief that the government has been infiltrated by reptilian space aliens. What are the chances? Okay, enough from me for the moment. Let's hear what everybody else has got to say. And I think there are going to be questions about other matters, too, and that's certainly fine. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, Z Stallone is up first. Is John the Baptist a historical figure? Uh, very likely he was, but there, there's there's the off chance that he isn't. Um, uh, it, uh, But Josephus depicts him as... Uh, as, as a human being in a plausible scenario, which does not quite fit the timeline of the Gospels, all of which would sort of imply, yeah, uh, he's been uh, um, co-opted into the Gospel story, but not very well. Was he a cousin or rival to Jesus? Well, at first, um, he was a rival at least a rival figurehead. We, we would have, you know, we're not even sure there was a Jesus. Uh, I think there's a bit more chance that there was a John, but uh, at least as the early church's movements developed, yeah, he did become a rival to Jesus in that the John the Baptist sectarians believed that John, not Jesus, was the real Messiah. Uh, was he a Gnostic? Not unlikely, because the uh, the Mandeans, whose name means the Gnostics, uh, they're still around in uh, Iraq and uh, ad adjacent countries, and they're they're definitely Gnostics of the old style, the old school. And for them, uh, John the Baptist was the redeemer, and Jesus was a false one. Was John a Sumerian? Uh, oh, I think I mean Samaritan a Jew or a Philistine, or was he a human version of Uranus, um, the, the god, the titan of the heavens? Uh, well, I would think he's, uh, you know, if, if he existed, to the best of our knowledge, he would have been one of the um, Gnostic uh, hermits and ascetics that lived in the Jordan Valley, like other similar groups, Hamero Baptists, Sabians, Mandeans, and all that. Uh, so I, I would think he was Jewish. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kevin Thompson mentions the Demiurge. And um, uh, let's see. 
Um, Kevin also says you're explaining, I guess, in the earlier presentation, the outcome of, of free will that you're choosing and uh, you may pay heavily for the choice. Uh, uh, Kevin also says uh, it's similar to Dante's Inferno, like the, you know, the, the list of Buddhist hells. Yeah, uh, though I think they kind of outdo Dante for a sadistic imagination. Uh, let's see. There, you know, Dante was basing what he did on a whole series of earlier Christian apocalypses, like the Apocalypse of Peter, which outlines specific hideous punishments for sinners um, guilty of this or that sin. So punishment fits the crime. What do you think, uh, Peter Abbott says? What do you think were the main objectives of forming Christianity? Uh, well. At least uh, in the uh, in the New Testament, the idea seems to be that it was a revival movement among Jews uh, to prepare for the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom of God and the final judgment, which apparently they based on uh, the current interpretation of Daniel's chronology of the end. Uh, that Daniel had reinterpreted the 70 years of exile that Jeremiah predicted, um, but and, and he had reinterpreted into 70 weeks or sevens, same word in Hebrew, uh, of, uh, of years. So there's 490 years after Nebuchadnezzar that it would come. And there are always uh, ways of manipulating the statistics and so forth. But at least many Jews felt that that was... Uh, um, that it was about time. One book that discusses this is Abba Hillel Silver, A History of Messianic Speculation in Judaism. Fascinating work. I guess I'm always saying that about books that I recommend, but I, of course I'm, uh, I'm not just a broken record. I, I recommend the ones that are fascinating to me. So, yeah. What do you think with them? Oh, yeah, sorry, did that, yeah. Uh, crossover Maniac. Oh, boy, a generous donor. You're going to heaven for this. A 10 buck donation. Sure appreciate that. Out of all those Buddhist hells, the eye for an eye hell would be the most fair if they didn't repeat the abuse for millions of years for a few decades of bad behavior. Yeah, it really is. Uh, Incredible magnification. It's a little hard to imagine the, a crime that deserves that punishment. Yeah. Mm. Is Pure Land Buddhism a Lutheran type of Buddhism? Yes, indeed. Uh, because the Pure Land, I go into this in the chapter of my book that's not yet appeared, uh, Houses of the Holy, a higher critical survey of the world religions. Pure Land Buddhism is a uh, a long tradition, actually, uh, that was elaborated by a, a succession of patriarchs who refined it theologically more and more. The basic part of it, which you find in the Sukhavati Sutras, the longer and the shorter one, uh, it tells the story of um, a, a Buddha, uh, actually originally a great king, uh, who now goes by the, the name Amitabha, uh, in Sanskrit, but in Japanese, um, Amida, uh, just a short version of the same thing. He was a great king and heard a, a Buddha active in his day preach about uh, the Dharma of Buddhism and uh, enlightenment and all that. And on the spot, he said, well, that's for me. I am going to take the vow uh, of uh, living many, many lifetimes to accumulate far more good karma than I would need for personal salvation so that I can make it available to others uh, who just cannot or have not uh, accumulated enough uh, saving, forgive me, brownie points. Uh, and and w what I'm going to do with all the, uh, the good karma I have accumulated zillions of lifetimes from now, I am going to create a pure land that is a land without bad karma in it, without uh, pain and suffering, without temptation, uh, where anyone born into it, reborn, 
right? You know, reincarnation will instantly reach the stage of non-returning, one of the several stages uh, to, of uh, progress toward Buddhahood and Mahayana Buddhism. It means once you get to this uh, stage, there's no chance of backsliding. Uh, you could otherwise, but no, you, you've reached a, a very important stage of uh, becoming a Buddha that people like uh, Amitabha had to work pretty darn hard to attain. You're getting there by the short path, thanks to his saving grace. And uh, later, uh, Patriarch said, well, actually, it's even better than that, because once you're reborn there, you become a full-fledged Buddha. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it makes it as easy as possible. So what is it you have to do? Isn't much, right? Uh, well, you have to call upon his name in faith. And you have to, because now the, the world is in such a stage of uh, religious degeneration and, and spiritual uh, uh, retardedness and so forth that there's really no chance you can work your way to it. It's just, I mean, look how, how few people do compared with in the days of the Buddha himself, Prince Siddhartha. Uh, there were loads of people that uh, claimed to have followed his directions and become enlightened in the same life. Why is that not happening? Well, we live in a fallen age, but this is a way of escape. And uh, so you got to call upon the name of Buddha because self power, as they say, will not save you. That's just you're, you're spiritually impotent. It's like in Alcoholics Anonymous, you've got to start by admitting, look, I, I am bankrupt I, uh, in myself. I am hopeless. I've tried a million times. I'm getting nowhere. If I get out of this mess, it's going to be by somebody delivering me from it. Uh, well, yeah, that's what they're saying. And Amitabha Buddha is the one who will do that. So you need to call on him in faith and his grace will see to it that you are reborn in the pure land. And uh, you have to rely on his other power, not self power. Now that already sounds like Protestant Christianity, right? But then they began to uh, start really microscopically analyzing it. How do you know you really have enough faith? Maybe uh, you've got an element of doubt that might ruin the whole thing. Um, and so they said, you've got to meditate in this fashion. Uh, you've got to uh, oh, do this and that just to lock the thing down. But Needless to say, this is like when the Puritans were debating, you know, how do you know you're worthy to take communion and all that? Well, if you're not totally worthy and you haven't had an experience of grace, we can make you sort of a second class Christian. You can come to church, but you can't take communion. Well, they had hair splitting, things like that. And uh, the last of the patriarchs was Shinran, and he made it virtually identical to, to Calvinism because predestination then entered into it. Uh, somebody thought, wait a second, if it's that easy to do, why isn't everybody doing it? Uh, why is it only some? And I said, well, I guess uh, they, the ones that don't are just blocked by uh, too much bad karma or God, just, Amita just doesn't choose them. It, it's ex it seems to me it's exactly the same logical process that led uh, to Lutheranism and especially Calvinism. Now, did they borrow this from Christianity? Exceedingly unlikely, uh, given the missionary situation and all that. It, it just seems to be a spontaneous parallel. Uh, it's like you don't have to, uh, similarities don't have to arise from borrowing. Uh, it may simply be that uh, you know, the same kind of minds that are present all over the world uh, face the same raft of questions and, and possible answers to the same dilemma that comes up again and again. And eventually you're going to have people come up with the same range of, of doctrines. You got to cooperate with God or with the Buddha or whatever, uh, or you don't, uh, or uh, it's it's predestined, so it's not really your uh, decision. They'll come up with the same stuff. Islam has a lot of the same debates. It's uh, Hinduism. It's no surprise. Like in uh, 
in one branch of uh, what is it, qualified non-dualist Vedanta Hinduism, started by Ramanuja. They, there are two schools of it. One is the cat school that uses the metaphor of mother cat who just picks up her babies by, uh, she gets the scrub of their neck and her teeth and carries them with the kittens where she wants them to be. That shows that Vishnu is, by his grace, is just saving you. You're entirely passive. But then there's the monkey school where the, the uh, mother monkey uh, grabs the hand, paw of, of the baby monkey and, uh, and takes him along, but he has to hold on. So each of you does a part and that's like synergism. You got to work together with God for it or it's like uh, Protestantism and Catholicism. They didn't get influenced by it. They didn't borrow from it. It's just the same kind of thinking that leads to the same menu of possibilities. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing. That's why I say if you want to understand the Bible and Christian theology, you got to learn all the other ones. Uh, because uh, seeing the similarity and differences and how they arise uh, puts a new light on all of them. Okay. Um, hope that was worth the 10. See. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, I'm sorry. That was Cross of Maniac. This is East Alone's Pure Land Buddhism. Yeah. Very much like Lutheranism. Um, somebody pointed that out to Karl Barth once. Uh, he, and he said, yeah, what that tells you is that it's not a theory of salvation that saves. It's the word Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. It's not a, a, a mechanical procedure that's unique to Christ. It's Jesus that is unique to Christ. And that is whom you must call on. Though Bart was not a hellfire type, he was seemed to be a universalist, he thought, in in Christ, everybody is reprobate and everybody is elect. Interesting. Okay. Um, Peter Rabbit, do you have any idea how they decided on the seven deadly sins? Seems like most of the major religions have a heaven and hell component. Well, the particular seven, I don't know, but I guess anybody would come up with uh, like the most popular... <laughs> widespread and the most serious um, vices uh, would probably be pretty much the same in anybody's list. By the way, um, I wonder if most of you realize that our friend Peter Rabbit has his own action figure available, uh, but uh, there he is, cape and all. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, mm, and uh, scroll down so I can see the whole question. Z Stallone, what is... Uh, wait a minute. Uh, what, what is the Middle, Middle Eastern religion that worships Satan for passing God's test to see if any one of the angels would reject bowing to Adam? Uh, and Satan passes the test by not accepting it and free thinking. Or, or actually, you got it almost exactly right. But uh, Satan, this is the Yazidi faith. Uh, I have a chapter on that in my uh, forthcoming Houses of the Holy. Uh, they say that uh, this was a test to see if uh, they would all refuse to worship anybody but the Creator God. And uh, all the other angels said, well, God says to worship Adam, to bow down. I guess I better do it. Uh, but this is like where uh, God tells Abraham his uh, progeny will come from his son, Isaac, who he can't realistically have. Miraculously, he and Sarah do have a, a son. And then God says, I want you to sacrifice him, stab him to death on top of Mount Moriah. You know where that is, don't you? You need a map. Uh, and uh, uh, and so um, the problem is, wait a minute, does this negate the promise he made about my uh, descendants coming through the sky? Uh, well, 
I now I, I know what he said, but I know what he says now, so I'm about to do it. Well, Abe gets rewarded, right? Because he doesn't allow him at the last minute to knife his son as a sacrifice. He, and he said, basically, I was just testing your faith to see if against all odds you would still obey me, and you did. Bravo. But the Yazidis with Satan say it's just the opposite. Uh, it's like uh, Satan said, wait a second, uh, I remember when God said to worship no one but him. If, if it seems like he's saying to worship or revere or whatever this two-legged animal he just made, uh, something's fishy here, I'm not doing it. Uh, I worship only the creator. Aha, that's just what I was hoping to hear. And the rest of you idiots, you know, uh, you, you're getting a demerit. <laughs> Oops. I'm, I'm pleased to hear you knew that. Okay. Richard says, we're on the highway to hell. Uh, you know, my uh, Bible geek uh, before was on um, Wise as a Serpent. Uh, I just did it uh through talk show, I think it was. And uh, for a while, my uh, intro music was Highway to Hell from ACDC. Maybe I should use that again. I like that one. Crossover Maniac. To be fair, at least the horrors of the apocalypse of Peter are finite, and uh, Jesus will save everyone. Well, I think in some manuscript, it does say that finally God's going to let everybody out. But um, which is far preferable, but uh, I suspect that wasn't the original because there are other copies that that uh, don't have an escape clause. But you'd sort of hope they would. Right? Does, isn't that implied about hell in the parable uh, that uh, if you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you, and you're going to wind up in the heavenly or the infernal debtor's prison, uh, and you're not getting out of there till you pay the, the last red cent. And uh, that implies you will once you uh, you have sweated it out. Um, and that's why people um, paid uh, for indulgences and so on to uh, get souls out of purgatory. That, that really is pursuing the debtor's prison analogy. Yeah, Z Stallone again. This guy is a dyed-in-the-wool Bible geek. Would Satan be right in rebelling against God if hell is God's solution for every transgression, no matter how minor? Well, I would think so. Uh, and in fact, you know, the Yazidi thing does follow from um, something you read, I think, in The Life of Adam and Eve, one of these pseudepigraphical books, uh, and that is a scene that is referred to in the Epistle of the Hebrews. When he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And before I even knew about the uh, apocalypse of Moses, uh, Life of Adam and Eve, I said, I just bet you that was not originally about Jesus, but about Adam and uh, all the angels worshiping. And then later on, I found out my lucky guess was right, that that was the point. He doesn't say he's quoting, uh, but, uh, well, he does say he's quoting something. Uh, he says, God says, uh, and it turns out it must have been one of those books uh, or a reference to the same scenario, because that's what made uh, Satan decide, wait a minute, uh, God is too old to be president <laughs> in uh, modern terms. He's senile. What the heck? We're supposed to bow down to this little homunculus, this Pinocchio? Not me. Uh, who's with me? And so they had a palace revolution, a coup attempt. Uh, they figured Satan would be a better leader. Uh, but God was partial to the two-legged animals like us. And uh, so... Um, you have to have some sympathy for, for him there. Sympathy for the devil, as the prophet Nick said. Um, um, Z. Stallone, uh, what is the origin of Easter? Uh, were there chocolate bunnies and peeps back in Israel? Uh, no, but it does seem to be a, um, 
a fertility festival. There may be some connection between Easter and English, right? And e, which, uh, because it's not a Greek word, it doesn't occur in the New Testament unless you're reading the mistranslation of it in the King James. Um, but it's related to Passover, and it seems like that um, that there were both fertility uh, holidays or rituals originally. And uh, that's why, despite all the cross and resurrection talk, you still have Easter celebrated with fertility symbols, namely eggs and bunnies. You know, so uh, it must have something to do with that. And it's a barely Christianized version of such a thing. And it's tied in with the dying and rising God myths of adjacent religions. And they were all originally fertility myths. That was tied in with them being kingship renewal uh, ritual myths because it was believed that the king was the bearer of the sins of his people and that the uh, death of, uh, of vegetation uh, was as a result of the sins of the people. And when the king paid for them by ritual pantomime of, of death and resurrection, uh, then sure enough, the vitality of nature would... Uh, Refer, would return. Uh, just like, I uh, can't think of the guy's name, but a scholar who wrote a book called something about ancient Greek survivals in modern uh, Greece or something. He, he said he happened to be in a little Greek village on Good Friday, and uh, they, were re they were having a passion play, you know, villagers reenacting the passion narrative. And uh, they had a guy dressed up as Jesus, and he's lying down on a stretcher, and they, they have a, uh, a fake tomb opening, and put they inter him there, and then, uh, they're, then he's going to come out okay, uh, Three days later, right? Well, the, the scholar is standing there watching this, and there's a little old lady next to him uh, who starts crying, and he says, uh, "Ma'am, what's the matter?" And he says, "Well, if uh, if it doesn't come out on Easter, we'll have no crops this year." Uh, yeah, she she didn't have to read the Golden Bough or anything like that to understand what was really going on there. Rosie well, Stallone says, "Does Easter?" Ha have origins connected to Ishtar, Esther, Isis holiday ritual. I think so. It's not quite clear, as far as I know, what the link is, but Esther is certainly another spelling of, uh, of Ishtar. And it's hard not to think Easter is too. Uh, and uh, there's supposed to be a Celtic, I think, uh, goddess called Eostra that might be the immediate origin for our word Easter, but I'm not quite clear on that. Oh, let's see, Thomas Clark says, good point about indulgences. You know, that's the rationale for them. Oh, hey, you're right. Uh, YouTube wouldn't like it if you used copyrighted music like ACDC here. Best not to play Highway to Hell. You're right. And just before the show, I was uh, talking to to Ray, uh, my producer, Bishop Taylor, is saying that I'd really love to introduce this segment on hell with the, some of the music from Disco Inferno, but then he reminded me, copyright problem, so we didn't do that. The music we used isn't copyrighted. Let's see. Mm. Is Stallone Bible Geek for Life? L O L. Oh, I guess you mean you are one, right? I can tell that because you're a dedicated listener and questioner. Well, that's about it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoops, whoops. Here's another one from Wise as a Serpent. I'm s oh, wait a second. Yeah, two of them from him. Uh, Gnostic beliefs often centered around the idea of spiritual enlightenment and liberation from the material world. Did they avoid the notion of hell or did they believe we are in hell already? Well, in effect, they did in much the, the latter, in much the same way Hindus did, because the, the, you want to be saved from reincarnation. Uh, and Buddhists, too, and they had pretty much the same idea. They believed that um, there were six lokas or locations, actually, uh, uh, that uh, you might be reborn into. Uh, and, and within each one, there were several slots you might occupy, but you could be reborn as a human again, as an animal, 
which actually would be pretty good because they don't live that long and they can't accrue bad karma. So, you know, you would, you'd be cool in their heel, your heels pretty briefly there. Uh, then you could be, um, let's see, uh, a Prata, uh, a hungry ghost, just like the myth of Tantalus. He's forever hungry, but has a, a huge empty stomach and a pinhole for a mouth so he can never satisfy his hunger. And uh, you could... Um, uh, you could be reborn in hell. Oh, I'm yeah, on the other end, I left out you could become a god because that would also be a finite lifespan and you would need to be saved from that. Uh, and I'm probably leaving one out, but uh, so but this is in effect one of the hells. But there is um, but there there are hells of torment like in the ones I read in Buddhism. And I believe there's some nasty hells in uh, at least one of the Nag Hammadi texts. Uh, so I, I'm guessing they had a, a system uh, much like Hindus and Buddhists, that you not only were not, if you weren't enlightened, you were not only not uh, headed for uh, the pleroma upon death, but you may might wind up in a very bad, non-saved uh, compartment. Yeah, boy. And do you think that hell is a controlled spell on the people? Yeah, and now I don't know if it was devised just as that, but I wouldn't be surprised because the whole notion of, you know, the Bible passage is this, be sure your sin will find you out. What does that mean? Well, uh, society puts sanctions on behavior to try to, to safeguard society in general and everybody in it. So there, and the sanctions ha are punishments, right? To make you an in simple enlightened self-interest calculate and say, well, I'd like this steal or get revenge by killing this enemy of mine, but it's just not going to be worth it because uh, the cure is going to be worse than the illness. I I'm going to have to go to jail or be executed or pay a huge fine I can't afford, so I'll just forget it. Uh, okay, great. Um, but um, uh, but suppose you get away with it. Suppose nobody knows it was you who stole or killed or whatever. Uh, well, look, buddy, uh, I still wouldn't chance it because even if we don't find out, God knows, and he's really going to give it to you. It was something worse than we could think of doing, and maybe in this life, but maybe forever afterwards. So I wouldn't chance it. That doesn't seem to work too well, because if you ask all the cons in uh, jail, uh, most of them probably were raised uh, as religious believers, but they just couldn't resist temptation. Uh, but that probably is the idea that, well, if we don't know, you're still not getting away with it. So think twice. Hmm. Uh, Hilly Cape, ain't no hope in hell. Indeed, you know, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Uh, Grand Pong, are heaven, hell, and indulgences entirely a creation of the priest class to control the masses? I have to think so. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, today's clergy don't sincerely believe in it, but I suspect that's why. I mean, that's certainly the function of it. And uh, despite the fact that, that it seems to be uh, just a gross violation of the very idea of a loving and just God, I mean, it must be important for some other reason if you're going to compromise and really render absurd the idea of God, which it does. Let's see, uh, Hilly Caper says the, the Brahmin caste started after. Uh, the uh, imposition of the live hellfire threat. I guess so. Uh, the first man was Yama, and when he died, he had seniority and became the king slash god of, of hell. 
uh, and he sends his hounds after the the dead to bring them into his kingdom, etc. Um, but in, in terms of a timeline, I, I'm assuming you're right, but I've never really uh, heard that or read that actually as to when that uh, building block of Hindu uh, eschatology um, came about. That's interesting. Uh, wise as a serpent, uh, they tell teenage boys that if they masturbate, they will go blind. So you're controlled by lies. So hell would also be a lie? Or is it to make people adhere to the rules of others? I think the two kind of amount to the same thing. Uh, that uh, Though the masturbation thing seems utterly preposterous, especially since they proof text it from the story of Onan, which has nothing to do with that. Uh, it, that is about uh, Onan, who's... Uh, the young son of uh, of Judah, the patriarch, and he's had three sons, Mike, Robbie, and Chip, and uh, they uh, and the first one, who was married to Tamar, died without ever impregnating her. And according to the law of Leveret or brother marriage, uh, the next oldest brother was to marry her and produce children which would, however, not be considered legally his heirs, but those of his late brother, uh, just for the sake of maintaining a line of inheritance. And uh, so uh, uh, the next guy refused to do it, I think, and uh, or, or uh, Judah said he's too young to marry you. And the third one was the famous or infamous Onan. And so uh, he did sleep with Tamar, but uh, he, and it, he didn't want to have his offspring considered somebody else's uh, heirs either. So he pulled out before he could actually hit her with a sperm. And, uh, and that was really a violation of the Leveret marriage law. He's cheating her of having uh, heirs for her first husband. I mean, I don't know what you think of that, that tradition, but that's what it's about. Uh, he's cheating her, and God kills him for that, not for masturbating. It doesn't have anything to do with that. Uh, it's not even part of the story. Uh, and uh, But that, that was all they could come up with to try to hang this on. Uh, and it, it's just ridiculous, both from a psychological view, as far as I know, and certainly from a biblical view. Mm. Oh, yeah, okay, so we already had that one. Um, yeah, quite a interruptus taboo. That's exactly right. Yeah, hilly caper. Yeah, why is this the serpent asks? Please tell us what you believe about near death experiences. Not uh, one thing or another. I find them uh, stories about the very impressive. Um, and and if they're true, I mean, if if uh, I should say, if they are veridical, I believe they say, if people are actually experiencing something that is not just a hallucination, then it uh, is really a great uh, basis for hope. But on the other hand, uh, I think it's Susan Blackmore. Uh, and others say, no, it, it uh, more likely is just a hallucination created by the dying brain. Uh, and the survival value, though it's odd to put it that way, is that uh, it makes death easier because you seem to be seeing your relatives in the white light and the non-judgmental deity there. And uh, maybe that's all true, but uh, I, I think there is an alternate explanation. So that would be great if it were, but uh, it's problematical. Um, the experiences may be of something real, but once you step beyond that, you have all these questions of what are you embarking on? What is it like? Where do you go? What do you do? Uh, when we've been there a thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Uh, there's a movie, I think, 
called oh boy I can't remember uh the totally unfunny Dudley Moore is in it and uh he's uh he's talking with the devil one day uh and played by another actor whose name I can't remember and he's uh, somehow he sees the devil and uh, he's asking him, why did you get thrown up heaven? What did you do? And uh, the devil said, well, uh, picture what you do in heaven. Uh, there's really nothing to do, but just uh, stand around all the time and butter up God. Oh, God, you're so great. You've done so many great things. And you're going to do that day in and day out for eternity. Kind of gets a little stale. See what I mean? Yeah, yeah, when you put it that way. Don't you have to put it that way? Or are you, the, the way out of that is to say, well, it's totally unlike human life because it's eternal. It's the eternal now in which God lives. Uh, I, that doesn't sound very good to me. I mean, you're just, you might as well admit you're a non-dualist Hindu and that upon death, your self is dissolved into this undifferentiated mass of uh, Satchitananda, being consciousness bliss. I don't care how great you say that is, uh, I'd rather be me. I gotta be me. Um, so, so it's problematical. I mean, I'm griping that I can't really picture it. Well, that's inevitable. So maybe there is good on the other side, but that's a big void to me. Ooh, okay, I went into this in uh, Luke the other day. Uh, Pomacalypse. How are we to understand how Jesus came to know Satan wished to sift Peter and the disciples, plural, like wheat? Well, of course, you know, the, the rationale there is that uh, Satan is pictured here in his capacity as the accuser, the one who sets up the tests to see if God's favorites really justify his favor. And like Job, he said to God, I, I'm afraid he's making a fool of you. I mean, given all these fringe benefits, you shower on him. Naturally, he's going to give you lip service and butter you up. Let me uh, take him in hand and we'll see if he's really sincere or if the goodies stop and will he start cursing you. Okay, let's find out. And of course, Job passes the test. Well, the idea, or when Jesus is in the wilderness, uh, the, the, the Satan, the adversary, is posing options for Jesus that don't seem wicked, but uh, Jesus sees through him because if he does succumb to them, uh, he will show he is unworthy of the title he's just been given as the son of God, right? You are my son, today I have begotten you. You are my son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, well, let's just see if he really is. And of course, he passes the test. So uh, Jesus in Luke 22 at the Last Supper tells Peter, uh, Satan has the right to uh, sift you all, to see what you're made of. And I'll tell you right now, you're going to flunk it, but uh, you're going to regret it and repent. And when you do, I'm telling you, you need to help your, your brothers come to terms with it. How does Jesus know that? Well, he could just know uh, his Bible real well and, and say, given the importance I know you're going to have as my lieutenants when I'm gone, uh, you do need to be tested to see what you're made of. And you're going to fail it, but uh, that doesn't mean you're going to be disqualified. You can try to do better next time and prove your worth. Uh, and so I'm telling you, it's not all over, but you need to act responsibly once it happens. Oh, yeah, let's see here. Or do we already have Jesus having supernatural knowledge, as he obviously does, uh, that uh, somehow he knows what God is saying and, and doing and what he wants Jesus to do. So you get the impression he has his ear to the to the sky and that God has told him this, like he's a prophet or whatever. Yeah. 
uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, uh, Dirk uh, says uh, Peter Cook played uh, the the Satan character who was called George Spigot uh, in his earthly form in the film. Thank you. I uh, yeah yeah I appreciate that. And uh, let's see. Dirk says. Uh, my dying brain is probably about to have a near-death experience. Well, I hope that's not true, the first part. Crossover maniac. Buddhism says, your soul is mixed into the collective mass of spiritual energy, or whatever we call it. Materialism says, when you die, your biomass is consumed and utilized in the biosphere. Actually, my gripe with reincarnation is that it says you will live again. Uh, what does that mean exactly? You're not going to have any memory of your previous lives unless you live a few thousand of them and you're an advanced guru and then suddenly you unlock the memory log. Uh, but uh, if my soul, what is it, like a battery in somebody else's flashlight? Uh is it is, is that in principle different from saying yeah my uh, rotting uh, physical body may become part of uh, something else uh, maybe part of something an animal eats and becomes part of a great you know that, that's immortality for you anyway. um. Was he still alone? Was Jesus a sinner when John baptized him? Well, I think according to Mark, it, it vaguely implies that yes, he thought he was, which is no big surprise because as Kant said, it's only the righteous who repent. The real sinner doesn't give a damn what he did. He's not going to grieve over it. And uh, isn't it true in your experience that people who seem especially pious and you can't think of anything wrong with them, they're the ones that say, oh, geez, what a sinner I am. What? What'd you do? Well, I had an unkind thought about Adolf Hitler. What? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, so in fact, it's sort of a sign of his being righteous that he feels like, well, just in case I ought to repent for anything I might have done that I can't even think of. So here, here I go. Um, uh, Matthew apparently figures he was not a sinner and that John the Baptist instantly knew that he was, that Jesus wasn't either. And he said, what are you doing here? What's a nice savior like you doing in a place like this? Well, uh, he says, like, don't worry. You're right. I, I don't need to. But it's good to provide a, a good example for the people. I mean, this seems to be a righteous thing to do. So let's let's go ahead with it. Uh, so uh, there's this anxiety. In fact, in the gospel, I think of the Ebionites. Mary is uh, reading uh, the Galilee Gazette and says, oh, look, uh, it says that uh, John the Baptist is holding a baptism uh, for repentance. What say let's pack a picket, picnic orange and go? And Jesus says, why? Why should I go? Have I committed some sin I'm unaware of? Like the, the, this was a problem, a real headache for a, a subsequent generation of Christians. Mark didn't seem to have any trouble with it. Um, uh, crossover maniac says, I can see why you don't put much stock in reincarnation. Science says the same thing, except it's based on actual experimentation and observation. Well, you could say, well, yeah, that's the difference between science and religion. Religion's based on faith. Hallelujah. I, I don't think that's a virtue. Uh, when you have to convince yourself of something you know is not provable or even particularly likely, you lie unto yourself. Uh, you, uh, you don't have any right to do that. Your certainty should not exceed the, uh, uh, the evidence for a thing. That's what you call intellectual honesty. A.B. asks, could you please explain the state of limbo, the realm between heaven and hell? Why would someone end up in this realm? Well, especially if you were an infant who, who perished. Um, 
SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, something like that. Um, they, the folks that came up with limbo in the medieval Catholic Church, they said the suppose the, the kid is still in the grip of um, original sin from Adam, so they couldn't go to heaven if they weren't baptized. If they were, that would expunge the stain the kid has you know, with, with no say from him, has inherited, that would take care of that. But if, if God forbid he dies before he can be baptized, he can't enter heaven, but he's not deserved uh, to go to hell. So where is he going to be? Well, in an eternal daycare center called Limbo. Uh, everything will be fine, lots of toys and stuff, um, but uh, he can't really go to heaven or hell. And I think that's where it came from. That's the way I've always in, I've always heard of it. Um, and it's and Protestants don't believe it. They'll just say, you know, the kid's going to heaven. Come on. Um, okay, is is that it? Uh, yes, I believe it is. So okay, uh, thanks for your questions, everybody. You are astute theologians, and I appreciate it. So tomorrow at noon, more Acts of the Apostles, chapter three. Great, interesting conundrums await us there. And then again at six, uh, we're going to have another special edition of the Bible Geek, uh, where we're going to talk about demons and exorcism as practiced today. It will be not without humor, but not without seriousness, too. So I'll see you then.